I am Venus Leopardas from Mindanao State University at Naawan, Southern Philippines. And welcome to the fifth Networking Friday sponsored by Atlantic International Research and a Center and of the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. This webinar is intended for the uh, Asia Pacific region. And today we are going to have two speakers. They will join us for uh, a discussion about the IOC Westpac activities. And the other one will speak about um, one of the components of the IOC Westpac on the coral reef uh, conservation efforts. So um, uh, at the lower part of the Zoom, you can see the Q&A uh, chat box wherein you can put your questions there. And uh, later on, you can go live for, uh, uh, for a discussion. You can also raise hands later on during the Q&A if you want to ask questions with regards to our speakers. So without further ado, our speaker, first speaker, have come a long way from working from uh, the Jamstack and then being selected as um, elected as a co-chairperson of the IOC Westpac. Please welcome um, Dr. Kentaro Ando. Dr. Ando, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Venus. Uh, my name is Ken Ando. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh, not yet. How can I do that? Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting Westpac uh, to this uh, Friday networking session. Uh, my name is Kentaro Ando, uh, one of co-chairperson of IOC Westpac, uh, and also a senior research scientist of Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology. So, uh, so uh, let me introduce, uh, I would like to introduce also the Fang Li Chao and Irene Tan, uh, Wen Zizu. Uh, I'm not sure they are here, but uh, they are the officers and secretariat of IOC Westpac. So let me first introduce about the IOC. Uh, IOC uh, is the intergovernmental UN organization mandated to promote marine science in all ocean basins. IOC serves as a local fo uh, focal point for ocean observation, science services, and data exchange. And the IOC was born in 1960s. Now we have 150 member states. And now, uh, so it is already, all, already over, but uh, we had the uh, uh, four objectives, healthy ocean, early warning of, for ocean hazard, resilience of society and ecosystem to climate change, and knowledge of emergency issues. And uh, IOC is uh, functional autonomy and different from the other UNESCO science program. Currently, the IOC provides its capacity to coordinate UN Decade of, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And Westpac is one of the regional subcommissions uh, of IOC since 1989. Now we have 22 member states and have had 13 intergovernmental sessions and 10 scientific conferences since its establishment. And this is one example of our activities. Uh, we conducted a 10th international scientific conference in April 2017. Uh, that, that was uh, taking place in China, Qingdao, uh, in 2017. But, and we planned to have this kind of activity in 2020, but uh, due to the COVID, uh, we, have, uh, we, ha we have to postpone uh, these activities. And we, wanna, uh, we are planning to conduct this uh, conference this year or next year. Uh, for this conference in 2017, uh, we uh, more than 800 experts were uh, you know, gathered. So this is the structures of Westpac. And at the top, we have the Westpac session and we have a, you know, a office in Bangkok. And under these uh, uh, activities, we have uh, say, uh, 16 activities uh, grouped, grouped in uh, you know, ocean observation services, marine science applications, uh, capacity development, and working groups. 
in my talk, I would like to introduce uh, uh, these, you know, uh, green, green, uh, green colored activities. And also Apple uh, will talk about her uh, activities uh, about coral reef conservation. Uh, WESPAC, uh, th this is the uh, uh, WESPAC priorities and areas of actions. Uh, we have uh, trying to uh, conduct the researches focusing on ocean processes and climate change, marine biodiversity and seafood securities, and ocean ecosystem health, and emerging ocean science issues. And to do so, uh, we try to strengthen science policy interfaces and also develop sustained ocean observations and services, and also advance knowledge on climate change, marine biodiversity, and ecosystem health. And finally, uh, bolster institutional and human capacity for future we want. Currently, uh, we have many partnerships in this, mainly in focusing on in these regions. So uh, you see uh, we have a lot of partnerships in focus, uh, mainly focusing in these regions. So let me introduce one by one about our activities, uh, which I think related to the uh, biodiversity observing uh, networks. One is about ocean observations uh, in these regions. Now we have two regional gooses under Westpac activities. One is near goose, uh, focusing on the Northeastern Asia. And uh, they are going to uh, you know, uh, conduct a smooth operation of near goose data, data centers. And also uh, conducting the uh, pilot project on cross basin climate monitoring section uh, in the uh, uh, Sea of Japan. And also develop the forecasting system, ocean forecasting system. Uh, we have another uh, regional goose named Sea Goose focusing on the Southeastern Asia. Uh, in this uh, regional groups, uh, they are also conducting ocean forecasting system and other observational activities, uh, monsoon uh, mon mon and also the monitoring of ecological impact of ocean acidification. And uh, okay, okay, uh, this is my example under the uh, sea groups. Uh, so uh, ocean forecasting system. Uh, team is developing the operational ocean forecasting services to support the decisions under seagulls. This is the you know the uh, animation uh, developed under the uh, seagulls, and also they are conducting the uh, 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 by using the model output. They are conducting the uh, coral bleaching risk, risk assessment. And also uh, they are conducting some workshops focusing on the uh, uh, ocean forecasting services. Next one, okay. So this is uh, also another example by the leadership of the expert in Thailand. Uh, Westpac Seagulls has developed the observational network for coral, uh, coastal ocean acidification. In 2015 here, we did not have so many coastal stations for ocean acidifications, but now in 2020, we could have more stations in coastal of our regions. During, during the periods, uh, we had webinars, intercurrition exercise, regional uh, you know, report, uh, something like that, yeah. And another project under the Westpac uh, marine plastic pollution has now become big issues for marine environment. Westpac established the marine plastic pollution project in 2017. We conducted several workshops to share information knowledge and to have better plastic science for solutions to society. And expert in this project published papers in this West, uh, in, in which Westpac was analyzed. Ocean hypoxia causes a variety of impact on ocean ecosystem, which requires oxygen for, for productivity 
and provide services that sustain people's livelihood. Westpac initiated the Ocean Oxygen Network in a bid to facilitate interactions and communication among researchers, uh, studying various aspects of deoxygenization and help inform policymakers on the issues for decision the uh, declining oxygen in clear coastal and open waters. And remote sensing has become an important tool for the managing of marine environment and for mapping marine habitats. To promote its development and application in this region, Westpac took demand-driven and solution-oriented approach to the development of application of remote sensing techniques. In close communication with national or local authorities, Westpac selected three MPS, Dibon Island, Pa Ngan Island in Thailand, and also uh, Kong Dao site in Vietnam as a pilot site based on their needs, and started to transfer relevant technologies of remote sensing and assisted in producing seagrass mapping for marine protected areas management. This is the enlarged plot of mapping site in Thailand by Westpac Ocean Remote Sensing uh, Project. So I, I'm not an expert, so I, I do not, uh, I cannot go into detail, sorry. But maybe try to you know, conduct the in situ observations. Jellyfish invasion in Westpac country is becoming an emerging threat to human as more and more cases of jellyfish uh, stung have been reported. Jellyfish have brought uh, havoc on tourist industry in coastal areas. Since the establishment of regional harmful jellyfish network uh, in 2017, South Commission has been coordinating the joint research on harmful jellyfish with field guide to jellyfish of Western Pacific published in early March 2021. To raise public awareness, outreach and awareness activities on jellyfish bloom and emergency response has been conducted for hoteliers, coastal government authorities and school students. The Westpac have uh, harmful algal bloom project would be the long, most long term project in Westpac. And I think it started early 2000, uh, 1990. How causes shellfish poisoning and fish kill when it happened? There are many species to cause HAB. So in such sampling, it's always important to identify its species. Westpac Heart Project has published several books on the current status of HAB in the region, in the Asian regions, and has been contributed to the Global Hub Network. Recently, due to the emergency of ocean pollution and eutroph eutrophic conditions in the coastal areas in Asia, HAB has now re highlighted to be occurred more frequently. Left map of HAB occurrence, this left map is the uh, uh, map of HAB occurrence until 1989, and uh, this is until 1990. It is clear that the frequency of occurrence of HAB increased frequently. Uh, recently, Japan experienced the occurrence of algae blooms east of Hokkaido in the last year. In this case, satellite data could detect the concentration of phytoplankton, and by sampling seawater, species causing this bloom was identified Karenia. This bloom caused big economic damages, in particular in the uh, Hokkaido island. Based on this situation, HAB project identified five directions of research. Uh, one is uh, about the needs to identify the cause species. Second is the use of technical advancement. Third is sharing good practice of monitoring. And fourth is advanced uh, of mitigation measures. And the final one is 
need to coordinate with other programs. The last slide, uh, the last in the last intergovernmental session, new program was established named CSK2. Uh, uh, this one, uh, I, I myself is taking lead, the focusing on the Kuroshio science uh, and also the uh, to society. That uh, we have two uh, objectives. One is to improve forecast of regional weather and climate uh, through the observation, modeling, forecasting, and prediction. And second one is the uh, science-informed regional fisheries and aquaculture management through the study of cross sea in relation to marine ecosystem variations linked to the effect of climate change and anthropogenic coastal activities. Now we are doing uh, currently uh, you know, we conducted the first international steering group, and then uh, we submitted the, this uh, CSK2 plan to the UN Decade Program in January 2022. Sorry, this is 2022. And now we are uh, conducting the two task groups focusing on the data and science action plans. And finally, I would like to introduce the capacity development activities. So how many minutes I have? Maybe not so many. <laughs> we have six minutes left, uh, okay, Dr. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. And some commission recognize the capacity development uh, as one of key means of implementation uh, that helps countries develop the foundation and that means to achieve their growth and development goals. Uh, with, this, uh, with the guiding principles, uh, we try to suit national and regional needs while closely following the global emergency issues. And also we try to conduct training through research and also try to co-design and co-develop with member states of Westpac and uh, uh, try to promote South and South and North to South cooperation. So this is the kind of the strategy of capacity development. And let me show some examples. Uh, this is one of activities of Westpac uh, named Regional Network of Training and Research Centers. So we uh, try to establish the uh, RTRC, Regional Training and Research Centers in these regions. Uh, currently, we could uh, establish five RTLCs. Among five RTLCs, uh, first two, uh, you know, the ocean dynamics and climate and marine biodiversity and ecosystem health uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, conducted in China and also in, in Indonesia. And the other three uh, has just finished its feasibilities and waiting, waiting for the, uh, you know, uh, green sign uh, from the IOC Paris. And also, uh, we recommend it to all Westpac programs to conduct training workshop in their capacity, and also encourage to our member states to support to conduct training sessions. For example, in 19, uh, 2019, harmful, oh, harmful uh, jellyfish sampling workshop was conducted and also, uh, and also ocean forecasting services workshop was done in 2019. National training course also have been done in 2019 and also 2020. To conduct such trainings, for example, this is just, just example, Japan and Korea has been supported via each funding trust to UNESCO. Uh, this is the final slide of my talk. So uh, in my talk, I introduce the activities of UNESCO, IOC, and Westpac. Uh, and also uh, I pick, uh, I pick, uh, I introduce uh, uh, several Westpac program and uh, working groups which are associated with a biodiversity observing network. And uh, Westpac uh, coral reef restoration program is also associated with biodiversity, I think. So Apple will talk about uh, the, her project. And it is, of course, important to enhance networking in these regions. 
So uh, we're gonna have the 11th Westpac International Marine Science Conference uh, probably this year or next year. So please join to this uh, International Marine Science Conference also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kentaro Ando, for a very informative and interesting presentation on the IOC Westpac activities, particularly relating to marine biodiversity conservation. We appreciate having this kind of presentation that highlights the contribution, the huge part of the IOC Westpac, especially uh, including your commitment in being part of the nation's goal in achieving the future that we want and the ocean that we want. So thank you for that, Dr. Ando. Now let us proceed to the next speaker. Our next speaker is a very known, a well-known scientist, female scientist in Thailand. She is actually, um, uh, she has received a lot of awards and um, including one of the 17 Asia Power Women of Inspiration and the UNESCO IOC Westpac Outstanding Scientist Award, and also currently the Sustainable Ocean Ambassador. Please welcome Dr. Suchana Chav Chav sorry, Chavanek. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank organizing committee for allowing me to join this event and I'm honored to be with you all today. So today I would like to share with you about how we use science and technology to a better coral restoration in Southeast Asia. And this presentation is a part of a coral conservation and restorations in the Western Pacific, which is under UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for the Western Pacific or UNESCO IOC Westpac. And these are the example of the activities that we do. We do a lot of technology transfer related to the coral restorations and conservations between countries in the Western Pacific. As we all know, that coral reefs supply a number of valuable and vital ecosystem services and goods, such as food provisions, shoreline protections, erosions, regulations, and so on. However, unfortunately, coral reefs are currently under several chronic uh, human impact, such as overfishing, pollution, increase of the sedimentation, eutrophications, and coastal developments. But actually, we can divide the impact into two types. One is the local impact, and the other one is the global impact. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are several factors contributing to the declining of the coral reef around the world right now, but can they be able to recover it back by themselves without help from us? We are not sure since we are the one that create all those threats. So what we are, um, can do is to have a good management, good implementation, try to reduce all those threats and then restorations and rehabilitation can come. We cannot deny that Many countries, particularly in the Western Pacific regions, in the Southeast Asia regions, have been using coral restorations as a tool to increase the populations of the corals in the area by integrating the science, knowledge, and the technology together. And we hope that at least this will one is one of the way to help a bit, and the coral can come back rather than let them recover it by themselves, since we cannot wait for so long. Now, particularly in the Western Pacific region, coral restoration is not just only for scientists, but many private sector and the company are also very much interested in this and would like to get involved, not 
because of the CSR or corporate social responsibilities, but they also find an opportunity for a win-win situation. Now, I would like to share with you a bit more on detail about coral restoration technique in the Western Pacific region, particularly in Southeast Asia regions. How we use science and technology together for a better coral restoration technique. Physical restoration is one of the popular techniques in Southeast Asia region. Physical restoration is defined as a repair of the reef environment from an engineering approach. Artificial reef creations is a common technique used for this a physical restoration in Southeast Asia area. Various artificial structures, for example, rock, concrete, like a reef ball, ceramics, like an eco reef, or a carbon steel a structure like a bio rock can be seen around these regions. This is also one of the most com common techniques using in Southeast Asia regions. Both flatman and nabbing can be used. So for this, asexual propagation is a quick and simple technique for a rapid restoration of degraded reef with a limited impact to the parent's colony. So this technique actually is good and is suitable when the donor source are available and when the resources are limited and high level technology or technique are not available. Another technique of biological restoration is sexual propagation. For sexual propagation, it has been started in societies about 10 years ago. In this technique, we need to consider the needs of the land-based facilities for producing the larvae and their subsequent survival as an attached juvenile coral that can be ausplanted to the natural leaf later on. So uh, when we're talking about sexual propagation techniques, how we do it uh, is not really as simple as uh, asexual. So what we do is that we have to wait for coral spawn and then after that we um, collect the coral eggs and sperm and then artificially uh, fertilize it on the hatchery and then uh, raise them for two years before we uh, outplant them into the natural habitat. So actually right now for these techniques, we can close the circle. So what it means is that for example, in Thailand, we found that when we fertilize them and raise them until five years old, they can produce egg and sperm again. So they become a mature state. Uh, when they reach the five years old. Compared to Philippines, it takes about three years, and Japan, it takes about four years for coral to become a mature stage. Additional to cultivations, we also try to develop additional technique that can help juvenile coral to grow better. As I just mentioned to you earlier, that we have to raise the coral in the hatchery for two years and it's well quite a long time and also it's cost quite a lot. So how we can reduce those two years time? So um you know for example maybe we can put the food additional supplement food to the coral or put additional light to them so that they can grow faster and we don't really need two years to raise them. And, and this is an example, we can add supplement food for the coral. And there is sure that coral eat it and can be able to digest the food that we give within a 2.5 hour. So this actually is another additional technique that we can add for the coral restoration when we culture the coral. And recently, what we found is that Coral associated microorganisms have become an interesting issue. As we can see here, 
that those microorganisms can have an important uh, factor uh, to coral. Well, bacteria can help coral in terms of nutrient cycling. Archae, archaea can help uh, in coral health, protecting the coral host from pathogens. And fungi can help coral in uh, 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 resilient to the climate change or global warming as an example. And, and this is from overcurrent uh, study. A uh, recent study showed that bacterial communities can be found in the coral starting from the eggs. And uh, after they become a juvenile, we also can find the coral communities associated in those stage too. And from our knowledge on the coral and bacterial relationships, we have used them to help the coral grow under the changing the environment conditions such as the climate change. For example, in this study, they inoculate the coral with the beneficial, beneficial microbe and found that those bacterial cocktail make the recruiting of the juvenile coral better. Well, to be a bit more advanced technique for the coral cons uh, conservation of uh, cultivation, now we are working on the cryopreservation in these Southeast Asia regions. So what is the cryopreservation? Cryopreservation is a technique for freezing the tissue uh, cell to preserve for use at a later date. So cells are stored at the ultra low temperatures about minus 196 centigrade. So for this cryopreservation techniques has been used and very common in humans, in dog, in cat, but recently it just we just introduced this technique uh, to coral for coral re uh, restoration and coral conservations. So well can we do it uh, for this uh, cryopreservation in coral? This is quite a challenge, uh, but well, we can preserve a sperm of the coral now, and uh, now we are also working to preserve the egg, but it's a little bit a challenge since the techniques of preservation, the egg and preservation of the sperm is quite different. But we know that if we can be able to do both sperm and egg uh, using this cryopreservation technique, this will be a quite advanced step to uh, preserve the coral in these regions. We also back to restorations how we can move forward under the climate change, under the changing environment, um, using the, the science and technology and how we can make a better coral restoration and coral conservations. We have to make sure that we are not just only produce the mass baby coral, but over baby coral have to be able to adapt to the climate and thermal stress. You may heard about super coral, right? How we can make a coral to be a green man, a hot, is very important because we do not want to produce a baby coral and then they die because they cannot really tolerate to the environmental change. So it is important that the coral restoration technique have to be adjusted and at once continuously to make sure that we not only organize the wedding ceremonies for coral or wedding organizer, but we want to make sure that we are a family planner for the coral, make sure that or uh, maybe coral that uh, we culture can come out uh, become a hot baby. So that's why we need science knowledge and technology together for a better coral restoration. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Chavanek, for giving us a very interesting uh, presentation about the coral reef restoration as well as uh, some of the most uh, uh, the emerging approaches for the restoration activities of the IOC Westpac. The coral reefs are some of the most uh, vulnerable benthic ecosystems uh, due to climate change and the human-driven disturbances. And your, uh, your presentation uh, gives us uh, highlights uh, what you're doing and it's, it gives us an inspiration, something that the world should see more and should be able to replicate. So, and um, I have to add that, um, the audience may not know this, Dr. Chavanich, but we owe you a very special gratitude for being here because I happen to know that uh, you uh, defer some of your personal errands just to be with us and just so you could make it for this webinar. So that's very well appreciated. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you very now, much. Yeah. yeah. So now we are uh, the speakers that our two speakers are ready for the Q&A. We have some questions. Um, there was a question in the chat box raised by uh, Dr. Kili Bogili about the, uh, this is for Dr. Kentaro Ando, about the application of the algal bloom methods for the freshwater ecosystem and will there be a chance for a collaboration? So I think, um, yeah, it's Dr. Kelly Bogeli from Botswana. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, where, is, where is the question? Sorry, I, I cannot find it's in the chat. It's in the chat, not in the Q&A okay. box. <laughs> yes. There are many chats. <laughs> The method for algal blooms applicable oh, okay, okay. I, I, yeah. freshwater I, I, I found that, yeah. yeah. Is there uh, any potential for collaboration? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 I'm not the expert about the HIV, so very difficult to answer to this question. But uh, yeah, uh, in, in the project, HIV project, yeah, uh, they, they first uh, try to ident identify the young species which cause the HAB. Uh, so maybe they are in, in such a, uh, procedures to conduct their research. Uh, maybe the uh, uh, HAB group uh, in Westpac uh, can share the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, procedures or technologies each other. And that is, I think, a point of collaboration, I guess, yeah. Hey, okay, uh, the same, uh, it's the same person, Dr. Kelly Bugali asked about uh, um, the presence of the jellyfish in their river system in Botswana. And um, was it a threat? And it happens that uh, Professor Eileen, Eileen Tan answered already that question. And so it's indeed a threat in the aquatic system. And uh, yeah, Dr. Tan, um, mentioned about her email for further uh, contact if there are further questions. But I wonder if De Dr. Kelly Bogeli have further questions about this. Uh, you can post uh, your, uh, so we can have a live discussion with us, uh, with Dr. Ando. All right, so maybe later. Uh, there is a question raised in the Q&A box that Dr. Kentaro Ando already uh, answered about, uh, yeah, it's the excellent presentation. Uh, so, and any study on public health implication of harmful algal bloom, particularly the red tide. Can you explain more of your response, Dr. Ando? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suleiman. Uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned here, uh, sorry, again, I'm not expert on hub, <laughs> but your question is quite important in every region. And in my, in my understanding, uh, IOC uh, has, you know, the uh, intergovernmental panel for HAB and trying to, you know, uh, communicate with local communities uh, to inform to the local people uh, about the health implication of HAB. 
HIV. But in recent, uh, in the recent two years, uh, uh, very unfortunately, due to the COVID COVID nineteen, uh, we could not, uh, you know, uh, we could not perform such kind of activities. You know, communication with the uh, uh, local people uh, uh, cannot be done yet. But maybe the after the COVID, uh, I believe that we should do that. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification, Dr. Ando. Now, a, a while ago, uh, Dr. Eileen Tan, the principal investigator of the IOC Westpac uh, Jellyfish Project, have answered uh, one of the questions of Dr. Kelly Bugeli. I wonder if Dr. Tan would like to expound more of your uh, response, ma'am. Ma'am Eileen. Can I talk? Oh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. I think he's not in a panelist, so I don't think he can, mm -hmm. she can talk. How is that, Mom Joanna? Uh, okay. Okay. So she's not yet in the panelist. Okay. So maybe later. Any other questions? I, I think if you can change the, uh, you know, the status of Eileen to the panelist, I think she can talk. Yeah, so Dr. Uh, Mom Eileen said she cannot talk unless the host allow me, so. <laughs> I will do that now, so just a minute. Thank you. For the audience, if you have questions about the coral reef uh, activities for Dr. Apple, please uh, feel free to post your questions. So after Dr. Tan will be um, um, uh, Ma'am Sa uh, Suleiman Sadiko, you raise your hand. So you will um, follow after Dr. Tan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Hello, Let's everyone. Speak, okay. okay. Uh, this is Eileen here. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ken, uh, Ken Endo, to uh, presenting IOC Specs activity. And thank you, uh, uh, let me see who on uh, this. All right. Okay, hello everyone. Yeah, I think everybody can see me now. <laughs> yes, okay, thank yes. you very much. Yeah, okay, hello. <laughs> Glad to be here today. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, thank, thanks to Ken, uh, Ken for uh, presenting the IOC activities, respect activities, and pertaining to the jellyfish program. Um, uh, yes, I would like to answer. Uh, uh, yes, jellyfish is a threat. Um, some species of jellyfish is is useful as as uh, food as food, you know. But then most currently our research is mainly focusing on the harmful jellyfish in our water uh, marine ecosystem. But um, if you look at the life cycle, jellyfish uh, bloom usually starts from the brackish water, which is uh, part of it is from the mangrove area. So if you are talking about river systems, I'm not surprised that there is uh, existing of uh, jellyfish also in the river system and it is indeed a threat um, uh, to the coastal communities or, or, or around the area. Uh, we have more and more reported um, uh, harmful jellyfish stung uh, happening in the coastal areas so that is something that all of us should be aware of. Um, uh, Please do contact us I, uh, uh, to have further discussion. And also, if you would like to have share some of our uh, publication materials, I'll be happy to do that. And also, I would like to take this opportunity also to address a bit on the HAB. I'm, I'm not in the HAB group, but I know a little bit about <laughs> HAB. Yes, it is indeed um, a threat to the health also. Usually, when there's any red type bloom, um, the, the local authorities would instruct uh, the, the local farmers, uh, be it uh, especially the fish farmers or, or the uh, mollusk farmers, especially mollusks because they, they are filter feeders, they accumulate a lot of 
this harmful okay, uh, phytoplankton in their tissue. So during the, the bloom, uh, the local authority would, would uh, ask um, the farmers not to sell the product until the season is over um, uh, because it, it does harm the human health. If we were to consume, it can sometimes cause death to human health. Uh, so that is the answer for um, um, uh, to the questions. Yeah. So back to you, uh, Ms. Chair Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, explaining, uh, Dr. Tan. Uh, you know, uh, the hubs issues has been there for a long time and still we have a lot of things research to, to be done with that and one of that is really on the challenge on the health of our you know uh, of the effect of red tide to the people and it's good because you shared your you opened your collaborations and others thank you for that and a, a while ago um sadiko um raised yes, your please. hand it, it's yes. yes yes please Good morning to everyone. This is Nigerian type. I am Professor Suleiman Sadiku from Nigeria, Federal Industrial Technology. Yep. Good morning to everyone. I am Professor Suleiman Sadiku. I want to thank the two wonderful presenters for wonderful presentations this morning on management of the ocean, particularly coral reefs. And I want to thank uh, Alan Tan for the wonderful answer you just gave to my questions. I wanted to know the public health implication of this harmful algal bloom, particularly the red tide. And you just gave a wonderful answer to it. We all know that this red tide thing is seasonal. And what is done, particularly in the Southeast Asia, Philippines and, and Thailand, is to close the season whenever you have red tide so that fish farmers will not sell their shellfishes to people. But to add to that, the public health education, to add to a wonderful answer, is to say that uh, this harmful uh, bloom, algal bloom, the red tide, they actually, they actually cause what we call the shellfish poisoning. Shellfish poisoning. And there are three types of them. We have the uh, NSP, that is neuritic uh, shellfish poisoning. Then we have the DSP, pyritic shellfish poisoning. And we have the ASP, that is amnestic shellfish poisoning. And all these three, they have the total effect on human health. I just wanted to add that to the wonderful answer of uh, Ellen Tan. Ellen Tan, wonderful. We'll collaborate. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sadiko. And Thank you. So Thank you. you are in that great, uh, this you. is a great opportunity for you to meet uh, your future collaborators. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wonderful network. Wonderful networking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Uh, there is a chat question uh, posted by Yamakita San. Would you like to uh, go live with your question to under, uh, Dr. Ando? Thank you. Uh, yes, my question is very simple. So uh, I, I think Ando San explained just a little, but I'd like to clarify uh, how is the uh, program of the West Park discussed and decided. And in addition, because uh, this Networking Friday is a kind of the session of the MBON. So I'd like to know relationship with the uh, IOC, especially uh, I, IOC office is kind of the partnership with MBON and the GEO and uh, GeoBON is also a kind of partnership with MBON. So if there is uh, any relationship between them, please let me know. Thank you. Okay. Uh... So the Westpac program project and the working group uh, were mainly uh, are mainly discussed at the uh, intergovernmental session. Intergovern intergovernmental session, uh, you know, uh, uh, we request to attend uh, 20, 20, 22 member states, um, uh, mainly in the Asian regions, and the uh, you know the country re uh, representative of member states uh, join to the uh, intergovernmental session every two years. And then the program and project of Westpac and also working group uh, are endorsed at the uh, intergovernmental session, uh, mainly held in every two years. So this year uh, we, we do not have the intergovernmental session, but next year we will have the intergovernmental session. 
And before the uh, intergovernmental session, uh, about uh, half years before the session, uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, we will send a circular letter to the national focal point of IOC Westpac uh, requesting any submission of program or project about half years before the session. And then and the national focal point in case of Japan, the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology uh, is a national focal point and they will circulate the letters uh, to all, uh, to the uh, uh, you know, IOC national commission. Uh, usually the, every uh, member state has national commission for IOC. And then through the uh, national commission of IOC, uh, circulate such letters to request the submission of the new project and pro new proposal to the Westpac sessions. That is a way uh, to, you know, endorse the program and project. And the uh, second question is about the relationship with IOC OBIS. Okay. IOC OBIS is, I think, one of project under the IODE. IODE is one of program of IOC. Uh, endorsed at the IOC General Assembly. And Westpac is, all, uh, Westpac is a subcommission, so a little bit different from IODE. However, uh, very much similar each other. You know, IODE is focusing on the ocean data exchange program. And Westpac is focusing on the regional program, uh, regional, regional activities under the IOC. And OBIS is one of, uh, you know, uh, project under the I. Uh, I think uh, under the I under the IODE, IODE is under the uh, you know uh, IOC. So uh, OBIS is one of activities of IO or IODE, I think. Yeah, and the Geo and M Bon is uh, I'm not sure there is some relation, uh, you know, some linkage yeah, with IOC. But uh, you know, uh, Geo was born uh, in 2020, 2002. Uh, by the agreement of intergovernmental uh, gathering, but it is, Geo is not under the U, 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 UN, and uh, I'm not sure about Mbon, but uh, <laughs> Mbon is one of important activities under the Geo uh, group on Earth, uh, Earth observation. Uh, Geo was mainly uh, born uh, by the uh, you know strong recommendation by CEOs. CEOS is a group of uh, Earth Observation Satellite yeah. Community. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, GEO, is, uh, GEO is, of course, the intergovernmental, but uh, uh, not under the you know, United Nations. Um, but, you know, uh, IOC is now, uh, you know, uh, trying, uh, trying to have a collaboration with uh, GEO, in particular the Blue Planet initiatives, uh, which is more focusing on the ocean. Yeah, that is what I know <laughs> about the international relations related to the MBO. Yeah. Just a rejoinder. Can, can I just add? Yes. Uh, yes, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. About about um uh that uh, Take Sang about us about the, the, the program how how it, they endorse and, and design. I just want to add is that it has to be the need of the member state too. For example, if a coral restoration is not the thing that is the need for the member state, then, you know, this project would not be really happen. The same, uh, like, uh, you know, the hemp or, or the jelly, uh, jellyfish that Eileen comes, uh, you know, um, 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 oh, enchanted it. So because it's a, a problem that occur in the Western Pacific region. So that's why this, this project has come out and, and endorse it. Mm -hmm. So actually, it can change, right? Uh, right, in the song, right? Like for example, this ten yeah, yeah, years, yeah, yeah. it yeah, can be this yeah, project, yeah. and the next ten years, it can be different projects. So it depends on the need of the member state. Mm, yeah, it is up to the member states. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Hi. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And we Thank need the endorsement from the member yes, states. Yes, Dr. Ando, would you like to add more? Just a minute. Uh, okay. Yes. So, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I, I have a question for uh, Dr. Uh, Sochana um, before we finally end our webinar. Uh, we already have a very engaging discussion and uh, 
you've shown us, uh, you know, as a woman myself, I, 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 I've get to know you as, as an inspiration in the field of research. And not only that you're doing research, but you're also extending, you know, the science to the people, translating all these ideas into, um, um, into technologies, transferring knowledge. And uh, how do you do this uh, with the, uh, do, uh, have you encountered uh, any uh, problems with regards to your uh, coral reef research as a woman? And um, because you've shown a really great success in your field. So it's somehow my question is quite personal. Well, uh, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Venus. First of all, um, I would like to say that, uh, you know, we'll be talking about conservation and restorations, either, you know, on the terrestrial or in the oceans. I think right now it's not just only us, uh, scientist groups only that can do it. We know that, you know, we are just a, a handful, you know, a, a small number of people here. So in order to be able to, you know, complete the goal, succeed, what we try to, you know, restore or conserve it, we need many stakeholders, particular, you know, citizen science. And that's why right now um, uh, you could see that uh, many scientists, you know, you know, have been trained into a science communicators. And that is important because we have to send the message that why we need to do it, why we have to study, you know, why we have to do the research. And, and I think um, uh, that that is important regarding the woman. And I think I'm very lucky. I have to ask Eileen too, right? We are, um, the IOC Westpac have been a very, very good platform. Uh, not just only, you know, that scientists meet with the uh, a government sector, but also allow the women, uh, uh, women scientists to do more work and you know to to engage all, all those different activities. So it's it's really nice, and I hope that any other platform you know would allow more women scientists to do like this too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very impressive work, and uh, we have one particular concern from one of our audiences. Hello, all. Thank you very much for the talks. I have a question. Could you please share the slides with us? So. Uh, um, the speakers will have to give consent to the organizing committee if the slides can be shared. I would like to share it to an NGO. I am a volunteer in Germany and they might be interested in becoming a partner. So that's from Diana Rico. So that is uh, noted and I think the organizing committee uh, is going to uh, confirm that uh, later on with uh, Mam Diana as well as of course from the speakers. So we have not much time remaining for our webinar. So I think um, the Q&A has been very engaging and our speakers really done a great job. So what we have learned from the two speakers are not just their activities uh, from their organizations and the implications of these activities to biodiversity conservation and the people, but you know, this stuff emerges like the collaboration, data mining, the data science, capacity building, the use of emerging technologies and, um, you know, uh, technology transfer, uh, it emerges during our a very engaging session. And we hope that this uh, discussion had provided us a better understanding of the current activities of our environmental managers and our researchers and why we are doing such, they are doing such. So with uh, the increasing efforts to openly discuss Marine science matters such as this networking Fridays. So our lack of awareness on environmental issues should be able to narrow down. And because of that, uh, um, because after all, it is, it is now and the future that we want, you know, we want to be informed of what the scientists are doing, what networks are doing for our environment. And, and that is for the sake of the conservation of our uh, ocean for the ecosystem services, maintenance of ecosystem services. So I would like to thank the organizing committee of the uh, Networking Friday for inviting me in moderating this webinar. Once again, this is Venus Lepardas from Southern Philippines. I thank you all on behalf of the organizing committee, the Air Center and MBON. I look forward to you all, our audience, to also take the rule of the researchers, of the speakers, and also in my part, so that we can have more engaging discussion in the future. So see you on the next Networking Friday next month. Thank you very much.